If you missed our review of episodes 1 to 4 of Resident Evil Revelations 2, or simply can't be bothered reading them all individually, then fear not. We are here to give you an overall review of the complete package. Much like its predecessor Resident Evil Revelations, which came packaged as a full game but divided its story into chapters, complete with recaps of previous episodes and previews of the next one, Revelations 2 is now available in a physical copy, bundling together all four episodes along with two bonus episodes. Don't worry, if you've been playing the episodes as they come out, the bonus episodes are available for download too. In a way, the retail edition is the ideal manner in which to experience the game. Having to wait a week for each new episode was frustrating on the one hand, because the game's good enough that you want to play more once each episode finished. On the other hand, the wait created a certain anticipation for the next episode, and being forced to wait for the resolution to each episode's cliffhanger gave you this sense of tension that brilliantly complemented the series' horror motif. Revelations 2 combines several of the series' best traits, claustrophobic combat, creepy atmosphere, collectibles, and hidden secrets to discover. Although it does feel at times like the game is trying to emulate the evil within. Many early scenes, like one that involves bodies dangling from a cage suspended from the middle of a spiral staircase, lack context for much of the game, and while the story's theme of a Big Brother-esque villain trying to inspire fear in their victims does provide some explanation, it's easy to think that the game is trying to be scary by hanging dead bodies from every available space and hoping it gets to you. In layman's, it's a little cheap. Set between the events of RE5 and RE6, the game is split into two campaigns, both of which play out across each episode. The story opens with Claire Redfield and Moira Burton, daughter of Barry Burton, being kidnapped by masked assailants along with other members of biohazard prevention agency TerraSave. Claire and Moira are taken to an island facility where the afflicted, humans who have been infected with a new strain of virus that makes them violent and hostile, run rampant. An unknown woman calling herself the Overseer watches via cameras and tells them the bracelets on their wrists record fear, tormenting the pair as they try to find a way off the island. The second half of each episode follows Barry Burton as he attempts to find his daughter with the help of Natalia, a young girl he meets when he first arrives at the island and seemingly the only survivor of what went on there. It only takes two hours to blast through each chapter, bringing the game to around eight hours in total, but the extra episodes add another couple hours each, bring the total playtime for the single-player campaign to a comfortable 12 hours. It's a mercy then that the co-op element works so well because you'll spend much of that time exploiting it to stay alive. Each character is paired off, Claire with Moira, Barry with Natalia, and once you get into the game's mid-sections and beyond, it becomes difficult to see how the pair of characters could have survived without each other. One section in Episode 3 sees Claire and Moira taking separate paths through an exploding factory, with both taking turns shutting off gas leaks so the other can progress, giving credence to the game's co-op engine and making it feel like an essential part of the experience rather than an item-gathering convenience. You really get the sense that they're relying on each other to survive. The reliance on your partner carries over into Barry's campaign, where Natalia's assistance becomes invaluable as the game progresses. Her ability to squeeze through narrow gaps and access areas Barry can't during puzzles becomes an essential survival tool, as does her ability to sense enemies through walls, which becomes damn near essential when giant invisible bugs that can kill you with one touch start appearing on the scene. At one point, he'll need her to turn a series of wheels on a higher platform that opens gates standing in his way. It's well thought out and a great example of co-op teamwork done right. You can switch between the characters at any time, which is pretty handy in Claire's campaign as she takes charge of firearm duty, while Moira helps out with a flashlight, a handy tool that does more than just light your way. Switch to Moira and you can shine it around to discover hidden items which gleam as the light hits them, at which point you'll need to focus the beam with the button press in order to identify what the item is. This is also a combat tool. Focusing the beam on an enemy's face for a few seconds blinds them, putting them into a stunned state that allows you and your partner to deliver a melee attack. Saves on ammo and lets Moira put her crowbar to suitable use. Natalia has a similar ability, albeit one that involves pointing at items to help Barry spot them. She can also detect enemies by crouching, at which point they appear through walls, ceilings, and floors as a haze. Her combat ability is the weakest of the four characters, understandably because she's a little girl, but she can pick up bricks and throw them at weaker enemies to stun them. If you're lucky enough to have friends, then the game can be played in co-op too. It also feels like there's a real effort to connect all these characters in ways that references the series' history right back to its first installment. The identity of the Overseer ties heavily into the mythology, and anyone who's been following the game's overarching plotline for a while now will find the answer to at least one of the series' mysteries resolved here. 
The characters develop nicely throughout the game, particularly Moira and Barry, whose relationship provides the heart of the story, and the ending sets up a tantalizing future for the franchise. You'll spend much of Barry's campaign taking a stealth-based approach that offers gamers the chance to sneak around and knife enemies in the back rather than engaging them head-on. This feels a lot more rewarding than just blasting down wave after wave of mutated freaks, which sums up a lot of Claire's campaign, but the experience is marred by a crushing sense of deja vu, as you trek through the areas Claire and Moira have already explored in search of them. The two extra episodes provide some welcome insight into Moira and Natalia's stories, although the difficulty curve seems to shoot up during Moira's section, even when set to easy. You have to hunt for food at the start of her mission, which acts as retries should you die. But once you run out of food bags, and you can only carry five, it's game over, and you have to restart the entire campaign from scratch. Frustrating to say the least, and doesn't inspire you to keep going if the worst occurs. Weapon upgrades are invaluable, and there's also a skill tree that can be utilized by collecting and spending points from rubies and other jewels found throughout the map. This is especially true of Raid Mode, an arcade shooting gallery that effectively acts as a glorified mercenaries mode from the previous games. The lack of online multiplayer is a disappointment, but picking a character and embarking on missions to earn loot, gold, and experience in Raid Mode is still good fun as a single player experience. There's been a clear effort on Capcom's part to keep the mode supported thanks to daily challenges that reward players with different items and collectibles. Resident Evil Revelations 2 all in all is a fine return for form for the series. It has its faults, but it's far from a bloated corpse. Was it good for you too? Come on, let's just get out of here.